and then uh, Professor Berger will uh, be able to sign some books outside at the table and uh, also just continue the conversation if the Q&A um, uh, spills over past the hour, which would be great. Um, we'll have a chance to do that um, outside the room. Uh, I'm Joanna Hearn. I teach uh, uh, in the English and Film Studies departments. Um, and before introducing Joanna Bird, I want to just extend some thanks to uh, people and organizations that made this possible. Um, first, I want to thank the Interdisciplinary Innovations Fund at the University of Missouri for the grant to fund speakers uh, who bring together digital studies and indigenous studies in support of our course, Digital Indigenous Studies. Um, it's a new course, uh, and we've been uh, really excited to teach it. Um, and I'd like to thank the Four Directions Indigenous Students and Allies Group for their support. Um, I'd also like to thank Mark Palmer from the Geography Department, who is my co-teacher for Digital Indigenous Studies. Um, and uh, Clarence Lowe, Associate Professor of Sociology and Director of the Peace Studies Program, um, he's really been an engine behind a revitalized Peace, study pro Peace Studies program, uh, including a new minor in Indigenous Studies. Um, and he's been uh, a real leader on this particular project to highlight this course and to build Indigenous Studies at NU through the Peace Studies program. And I'd especially like to thank Anastasia Schulhoff, who is here behind the camera, everyone. <laughs> um, <laughs> wave your hand. Um, graduate student in the sociology department, uh, who's just worked incredibly hard and been a fantastic partner in making this happen. Um, and she's been here in support not only of, of this project, but in different studies across campus. Thank you. Um, and I want to thank Professor Jody Bird for joining us today. Uh, Professor Bird is a citizen of the Chickasaw Nation, and she's Associate Professor of American Indian Studies at the University of Illinois at Champaign-Urbana. Um, her 2011 book from the University of Minnesota Press, it's here and also there are copies outside. Uh, it's called The Transit of Empire, <coughs> Indigenous Critiques of Colonialism. Uh, it won the uh, Best First Book Award from the Native American Indigenous Studies Association, uh, and it won it for good reason. Um, it's an intensely theoretical book and a really visionary one. Um, it takes on nothing less than the construction of Indianness as a mobile category of US colonization, a transit. Uh, by which the U.S. has organized legal, political, and expressive power in service of imperial projects. Um, her book, as Phil Gloria writes on the back cover, which I, it's a quotation that I love, puts Indianness at the center of American histories. It also extends conversations about indigeneity across oceans and continents, across uh, uh, geographies, proposing an indigenous critical theory for global resistance to state formulations. Today she's here to share work from her new project on indigeneity and video games. And in this morning's Digital Indigenous Studies class, she led us through a history of frontier spaces in video games, from the early Atari Custer's Revenge to contemporary games like Bioshock Infinite and Second Son, making visible the ways that gaming culture enables us and enables the U.S. to think about ourselves and itself um, in relation to imperial I'm really looking forward to hearing more in her talk, Nothing is True, Everything is Permitted, Indians, Assassins, and the Gamification of History. Thank you very much, and welcome, Professor. Um, yes, as Joanna said, um, this is from my textbook. I'm in the process of working on it, looking at um, video games like Assassin's Creed, Bioshock Infinite, um, looking at um, Doctor Who, um, spectacles and genre, as a way to think about how it is that Indians are visible and not visible within U.S. Um, discourses of uh, participatory democracy, um, especially as it points towards inclusion. Um, but it's wide-ranging in the same way that the um, first book was and the geographies that I hopefully will be able to bring into in, to bear on this will and also include um, sort of the global indigenous um, scope. And I'd be happy to talk more about what Global Indigenous Studies is doing in Illinois in the Q&A and other things, but I'll, I'll, I'll get to the actual talk here. Um, I, I have a tendency to read fast. I'll try to keep it slower. I always get a little nervous at something that has never gone away. I come from a really small town in the middle of Nebraska and I haven't quite outgrown that after all these years being a professor. Um, <clears throat> all right, 
Thank you. Territoriality, race, performance, and culture are all weighted words, often politically so, and are terms that circulate without much consensus as to what they represent as they cross disciplines and fields of study. They are broad terms that carry assumptions and contestations about the past, about the body, and about genealogies, kinships, and communities. And yet they matter in their specificities, especially as we think about the politics of space and identity, relationship and community, and archives and media. Within the fields of American Indian and Indigenous studies, territoriality, performativity, culture, and race often pushes towards questions of the anthropological, the ethnographic, and the embodied in ways that temporalize and naturalize indigeneity to the land and to a past that grapples with the priority of origins. As American Indian and Indigenous studies take stock of the violent histories of displacement, territorialization, and colonization, the processes through which land has been rescaped through the absence of native nations, and the presenting of colonial mastery have become more clear. The transforming and conforming of spaces into maps, land into landscapes, and landscapes into property depend upon the performances and repetitions of colonialism that assert normative control through political, legal, cultural, and racial productions. As genres emerge and technologies shift and transform the speed at which narratives about the past, present, and future are imagined and conveyed, the stakes for interrogating how the ongoing colonization of indigenous lands and peoples depends upon neoliberal discourses of inclusivity, civility, and, dis and visibility become more crucial. Toward that end, my talk today will reflect on how the narrative and machinic states of video game play, especially and specifically in the concept, context of the Assassin's Creed <coughs> franchise, configure and reconfigure settler colonialism through spectacles of space, procedure, and code where such aesthetic and embodied practices collide with the neoliberal investments in negotiating histories of colonization and racialization, notions of affective inclusions within and toward participatory democracy emerge to justify the continued occupation of indigenous lands for the sake of the world. That cost, where the good of the many outweighs the good of the native, is perpetuated within the horizons of video games and at the site of what Jody Dean has labeled the communicative capitalism of our socially mediated lives. Indigenous peoples have not fared well in video games. I see this outright and as, as an avid gamer, and in the face of those who would argue that video games function and thereby should be judged by different rules of analysis. Begin like this, Alexander Galloway suggests, quote, if photographs are images and films are moving images, then video games are actions, unquote. As actions, video games have required players to slaughter, rape, pillage, and conquer indigenous peoples in their lands for the last 30 years or so. From the expected mindless enemy savage combatants of Dark Watch versus of the West, to the noble vision quest shamans of Brave, the search for spirit dancer, video games have, in this one area at least, taken their cue from film and from the deep, deep archive of racist and colonialist representations of indigenous peoples around the world. The fact that video games, as those who study them continue to assert, require new methodologies to engage only underscores the degree to which issues of gender, sexuality, heteronormativity, racialization, and colonization continue to haunt the imaginations of those who design, produce, create, and critique games. A video game is, after all, and as Galloway also acknowledges, quote, a cultural object bound by history and materiality, consisting of an electronic computational device and a game simulated in software, unquote. When it comes to video games, indigenous peoples have served as unthinking hordes, faceless antagonists, broken English-speaking tour guides, sexualized objects of fetishization, inhabited primitive objects on land soon to be con conquered, and in the iOS pocket game Pocket God, have any of you ever had a chance to play that? Um, they are hapless islanders to be capriciously fed to sharks and jettisoned into volcanoes. This observation is not a new one by any measure, and many games are now notorious for their violent colonialist pathologies when it comes to American Indian and other indigenous peoples. Take, take the infamous Atari 2600 game Custer's Revenge, for instance. Within the annals of racist, sexist, and heteronormative gameplay, Custer's Revenge is there as a prime example. Released just three months after the abysmal game industry destroying E.T., the extraterrestrial, in 1982, Custer's Revenge sought to target an adults-only audience with a ludic fantasy of horrendously epic proportions. At the level of graphics, though, it's not much. The narrative is thin as it sets up a basic premise to explore how a digitally resurrected general could seek revenge for his military defeat at the Battle of Little Bighorn. The gameplay itself is equally sparse. The player controls a nakedly erect Custer as he dodges arrows to make his way across the screen where a naked, large-breasted American Indian woman named Revenge is tied to a cactus. 
If the player's movement across the field is timed successfully, Custer's reward is to rank the woman, and then the game resets with the player and Custer back at the other side of the screen to make the next attempt until the player runs out of lives. Given such trajectories, it is safe to say, then, that video games have continued to struggle with indigenous representations at the same time that they have tended to rely upon expansionism as game mechanic. Sid Meier's 1994 algorithmic simulation game, Colonization, has been roundly critiqued for its gamification of the New World Conquest, in which American Indians function primarily as obstacles within the larger mechanics of imperialist play. The goal? Conquer the Americas as one, of the num as one of a number of European powers, build a democratic society, and finally fight for independence from the initial founding mother country to the reward of exploding fireworks and ringing liberty bells. While American Indians are at least present, Meyer's game absence completely the history of slavery, constructing in the process a new world narrative of white capitalist ingenuity that literally commodifies and masters territoriality single-handedly. With a command line god cheat mode, however, the player can eliminate natives from the game altogether with a keystroke, and thereby circumvent the algorithmic constraints of needing to keep the natives happy as trade partners and allies. The resultant terra nullius exists alongside the terra incognita mode of exploration, as the player races against the computer AI to achieve maximal profit on the way to liberty for some. That terra incognita is so pervasive a let trope within video games is also well known and often theorized, and as such it has inspired countless articles investigating how games encode architectural space and territoriality, which players then uncover as they navigate and explore digital wildernesses. From wayfinding to map making, strategy, strategy simulations such as Age of Empires and Civilization, first person shooters and role playing games including the Elder Scrolls, Fallout, um, and Bioshock series, and third person open world sandboxes including Assassin's Creed, Fable, and Alan Wake, to name just a few, depend upon terra incognita revealed in order to operationalize discovery at the quotidian level of play. One enters a game world fresh, and through tutorials, trial and error, and wandering, the player uncovers more and more space, while often achieving more and more power. Henry Jenkins and Mary Fuller foundationally argue that such new world metaphors embedded within games are essential to a game's ability to construct and tell a story. Quote, our cultural need for narrative can be linked to our search for believable, memorable, and primitive spaces, they write, and stories are told to account for our current possession or desire for territory." Unquote. The scholars and critics have continually articulated the colonial nostalgia encoded into such spatial relationships. Cartography, exploration, and discovery continue to structure a player's entry into the worlds of most games. Level designs from platformers to open world sandboxes depend upon the embodied mnemonics of landmarks, maps, and paths to effectively help the player navigate simulated 3D environments. Given the gener generic pervasiveness of such elements, the over-sexualization of the native body, the hyper-visible spectacle of savagery, and the cartographic modes of first discovering and then opening space, it might be tempting to say that, video, that the obviousness of the colonial tropes upon which games are designed would position these kinds of interfaces to transform players' awareness of and sensibility to the ongoing processes of colonization that shape our daily lives. Yet often, such mechanics reinforce and naturalize hegemonic power and normativity rather than disrupting either. In fact, Catherine Malibu observes, quote, neoliberal ideology today itself rests on a redistribution of centers and a major relaxation of hierarchies. Domination and the crisis of centrality and a merely, merely seeming paradox are perfectly ma matched with each other, unquote. In recentering the functionality of plasticity as something beyond the notions of flexibility already co-opted by global capital, Malibu's gestures toward a transformation of modes of relationality that rewire, rescript, and reframe how we understand how the brain thinks about capital. <coughs> Triangulating race, capitalism, and gender through the rise of Unix, Tara McPherson has observed a troubling accompaniment to the neoliberal co-optation of network flexibility and decentralization that Malibu diagnosis, quote, certain modes of racial visibility and knowing, McPherson writes, coincide or dovetail with specific ways of organizing data. If digital computing underwrites today's information economy and is the central technology of post-World War II America, these technologized ways of seeing and knowing took shape in a world also struggling with shifting knowledges about and representations of race." <coughs> Such observations might be extended to consider the larger frame of New World colonization, and Patrick Wolfe's now conditioned an oft-repeated contention that, quote, invasion is a structure, not an event, unquote seen an apt bridge as indigenous studies forefronts the protocols, procedures, and implementations of settler colonialism at the level of institutions, cultural productions, 
and spatial animacies of networks. Certainly, indigenous critiques of colonialism refocus attention on the structural logics that, of the everyday that normalize and condition the political and biopolitical seizure of indigenous lands and resources as recurrent processes achieved through, an affective, and, through the affective and in, intimate vectors of sociality and livability. Such conditions, First Nations Diné scholar uh, Glenn Colfart argues, compels indigenous peoples to rage against empire from an embodied and felt expression of resentment. Indigenous animus, understood here as an intense disposition <coughs> against, mobilizes dissent against the modes of belonging that had conscripted indigenous lands into North American democratized colonization. All that is well and good, you might be thinking at this point, but why turn to video games specifically, and of all things, as a form through which to think through and against colonialism and towards decolonial remappings of space, territoriality, and sovereignty? especially given the dreadful and precarious relationship games have had to and with colonialist discourses about indigenous peoples, and particularly because games continue to be deemed trifles, time wasters, and in their worst iterations, violently <coughs> masculine fantasies of militarism, domination, and control. While the game answer to such questions could likely fill the book, and will hopefully one day uh, fill my next one, which I'm calling Indigenomicon. I can tell you a little bit about the name after and uh, during the Q&A as well. For the sake of time, the answer might be a bit simple after all. While it is true that games reflect, engage, and require player response and input, that they derive from complex algorithmic lines of code, and that they need machines as well as players to progress, they remain material objects in this market and sold within the larger circuits of US imperialism. They depend upon crowdsourcing, networking, and collective institutional values of what Jody Malamud has named neoliberal multiculturalism, the current mode of state anti-racism, that reconfigures multicultural democracy and ties notion, notions of global humanity to the larger project of global racial capitalism. But most per pervasively or persuasively, perhaps, it is perhaps it is because they have the potential to provide a cathartic, affective, and embodied response in those who play them. That video games have failed so consistently at the side of gender, sexuality, race, and colonialism is then exactly the point. After all, video games recognize failure and repetition, wrote in practice, trial and error as one strives for mastery, control, or just the next experience. The paradox Jesper Yule explains, quote, is not simply that games or core tragedies contain something unpleasant in them, but that we appear to want this unpleasantness and pleasantness to be there, even if we also dislike it, unquote. According to Yule, video games teach the art of failure as a precarious structural arrangement of play that exists between pain and desire and risk and safety at the edge of challenge, frustration, and consequence, or even its lack. That, quote, the freedom found in regular games can only, be, can only be preserved if we are given room to experiment, and the freedom to fail, at least temporarily, such that a single performance will not be used against us, unquote. That desire for, freedom to, for the freedom to fail arises from the constraints of the, the everyday places upon all of us to succeed. But as Jack Halberstam also points out, there's something particularly and valuably queer about the art of failure. Within the shadow feminisms and the unbecoming, undoing, and violating modes of negativity and refusal, one, quote, can use the experience of failure to confront the gross inequalities of everyday life in the United States, end quote. At every level, American Indians have had to bear the brunt of those gross inequalities that have spatialized the United States out of and on top of indigenous lands. As games grapple with the performative function of code, and computers provide new ways of thinking about spatialization, identification, and disembodiment, it is necessary for scholars interested in emergent modes of media to address the juridical and procedural elements of colonialism that are sutured to the affective investments of an ongoing US settler imperialism that hides itself within neoliberal inclusivity and operationalizes its futurity at the level of individual freedom, autonomy, and play. And nothing is apparently more neoliberal than the American Revolution. Or at least, that's what is, that, at least that is what North American game designers would have us believe as they pathologically return them again and again to this national, historical, and spatial spectacle to restage founding narratives of possessive territoriality through the, all the modes of New World generic conventions. October 30th, 2012 saw the release of two highly anticipated video games, the first, Assassin's Creed III, was developed by Ubisoft Montreal and features a half-English, half-Mohawk character named Robert Green. <coughs> Set during the early 21st century on the cusp of the alleged Maya-December 21st, 2012 apocalypse, as well as during the late 18th century on the cusp of the American Revolution, the game opens with a dramatic cutscene sequence detailing the story thus far. In a race against time to prevent the total annihilation of the planet by solar flares and the total loss of individual will and rights of the totalitarian Templars, 
think Dan Brown conspiracy theory here. The game begins in Mabius' race as the assassin heroes arrive finally at an ancient alien first civilization warehouse somewhere in New England. Returning correct protagonist Desmond Miles serves as the player's persona for the 21st century sequences, and after an eight or so hour diversionary prologue in which gamers play, and I'm sorry this is gonna be a spoiler, um, as a Templar named Nathan Kenway, the game eventually settles the action on his son, the half Mohawk, half British Radha Gaiden, also known as Connor, as he grows up, trains to be an assassin, and maneuvers New England settler colonial civilization as it begins to encroach upon the frontier where his own Mohawk people continue to reside. How many of you have played Assassin's Creed 3? Few of you. Okay, good. <laughs> a little like it's really hard to try to sum up a video game that's hour like, you know, 20 to 40 hours long and then, yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, I'll do the best I can. <laughs> A little like James Fenimore Cooper's Hawkeye, Radha Gaydon, whose name, according to the game designers, translates as, quote, a life that is scratched, helps build order on the frontier while single-handedly ensuring that the major events leading up to the American Revolution, including the Boston Tea Party, Paul Revere's Ride, and the compiling of Benjamin Franklin's almanac pages are successful, even if it means that Connor's part in them is forgotten and lost to time. The game released to almost universal acclaim, with even Indian Country Today media network weighing in to declare AC3 to be, quote, the most anticipated title in Indian Country in recent years, unquote, and celebrating it as proof that, quote, it's possible to make good entertainment without dragging out the same tired stereotypes, unquote. It was not the first time that a game was designed around an indigenous protagonist. Turok, Ru, uh, um, Utu, and Domasi Tommy Talwodi from Prey are Connor's gamic <coughs> genealogical ancestors. But what AC3 did do was attempt to provide historically accurate and culturally grounded representations of life of the early colonists and the Mohawk by bringing in historians, cultural advisors, and Mohawk language speakers to help shape the story. <coughs> that it fails is not especially surprising given the fact that the narrative centers on a Mohawk character whose entire raison d'etre is to ensure that the American colonists are successful in the revolution. As a historical side note, the Mohawk rather importantly sided with the British throughout most of this period, and this little detail, um, the game designers decided, uh, decided to change for playability, accounts for their continued presence as a nation on the border between the US and Canada. Deemed as savage by Templar bullies who harass him early in the game, Connor proves himself against all adversity to be a champion for truth, justice, and multicultural democracy. Oh, and occasionally he'll fight for his people. As the third installment of a much larger narrative arc that actually includes nine to ten other games at this point, depending on how you count and what you include, um, and as well as a graphic novel spin-off, AC3's two different playable timelines interweave um, inventively through something called the Animus, an Abstergo Industries virtual reality simulator that allows some in-game characters, and primarily Desmond, to jack into a chair and access his um, ancestors' life experiences through DNA memory and genetic code. Introducing the first Assassin's Creed as a navigational mechanic and starting a new interface, the Animus functions as a HUD unit that allows Desmond and players to boot up and synchronize specific strands of ancestral memory identified on a DNA double helix. These are also the stages of the game that one can play. Not every memory is available at the start of the game, and much of the tutorial architecture of the Assassin's Creed world uses the Animus as both plot device and as engine in an attempt to break down the logic and narrative separation between player, Desmond Miles, and the male ancestor he inhabits for the duration of the game. The Assassin's Creed universe, as many have observed, is obsessed with fathers and sons. At the level of ancestry, genetics, and DNA, there's something rather clinical and committed about the game's approach to multicultural inclusion, ancestry, and racial identity. From the beginning, the Assassin's Creed series has skirted complex religious and geopolitical histories with a vague disclaimer, quote, inspired by historical events and characters, this work of fiction was designed, developed, and produced by a multicultural team of various religious faiths and beliefs, unquote. That disclaimer, within the broader context of the ongoing U.S. war on terror, anticipates and apprehends critics um, who might be tempted to read the game through the lens of global politics, but in the process of forestalling such concerns, the disclaimer symptomatically points to the material stakes embedded within the game's emergence in November, 27, in November 2007. Indeed, the Assassin's Creed series across its many installments is entangled within the larger circuits of what Jasmine Puar has identified as terrorist assemblages, a network of, quote, connections among sexuality, race, gender, nation, class, and ethnicity in relation to the tactics, strategies, and the logistics of war machines. <coughs> the work of both the disclaimer and the game is to, at some level, alleviate gamer and industry anxieties that the 
formation of the Syrian assassin might be too raw and sensitive as, a gamic action, as the gamic action emphasizes suicide missions and stealth kills. As the main character created within and informed by various faiths and beliefs, Desmond Miles likewise <coughs> descends kind of vaguely and non-threateningly from a diverse cast of multiracial antecedents. Syrian-born assassins Altair ibn Mahad, who speaks English with an American accent, Italian Renaissance man Ezio Auditore de Firenze from the second game, who gamifies seduction, and then finally, um, assassin, well, assassin turned Templar Brit Haytham Kinway, and Mohawk Radha Gaden Connor Kinway, each of these in various iterations to the cross. And then, there, you, as more installments come, more ancestors of Desmond get revealed. In spite of such rich historical and cultural groundings, Desmond identity is the, Desmond's identity in the 21st century is the model of a very modern post-racial, if not non-racial, construction where whiteness and U.S. citizenship are assumed to be the fulfillment of history as well as character. Ambiguously, almost, but not quite, the 21st century descendant of four continents, unlike his 12th, 15th, and 18th century paternal generic forebears, achieves the embodiment of a neoliberal multiculturalism tied to an acknowledgement of the difference that is not actually one. As Lisa Nakamura and Peter A. Chow White point out, um, the techno-genetic turn and the shift from deconstructive inquiries to digital ones, quote, offers a language for talking about race that feels safe for many because it moves race comfortably out of the social and into another seemingly less contentious realm, unquote. In pursuit of, quote, history as it really happened, unquote, that's the game, sort of the it's, idea it's jacking into all these genetic memories so we can get a, an unvarnished truth out of it. Um, <clears throat> so as, as history as it really happened, embedded within the ancestral codes of DNA molecules, the Assassin's Creed narrative world depends upon a temporal historicity and futurity derived from an unbroken chain of Y chromosome patriarchal heterosexual reproduction that links generational chain upon generational chain for progressive inclusion. Constructed in heteronormativity, each of the male characters introduced in the game world are assured of a direct male line of descent to Desmond. The apotheosis of DNA memory, along with its intended notions of genetic ancestry within the Assassin's Creed universe, is very much the product of a wider circulation of ethnic and sexual identities, conscripted to national formations as racial activities, as well as the anxieties produced through the maintenance and or transgression, transgression of the color line through miscegenation, passing, and transnational adoption. The popularization of DNA testing and genetic ancestry research with the simultaneous rendering of the contested social concepts of race and sexuality into essential and nat nat natural phenomena can be traced and that, that can be traced and known informs how Ubisoft designers approach the concept of genetic memories encoded within DNA material for the series. According to Kim Talbert, quote, genetic ancestry tests involve assumptions of uncomplicated social continuity between present-day ethnic, national, racial groups and groups in the past, even if those groups are genetically related, unquote. When Assassin's Creed III introduces, introduced Connor as one of Desmond's ancestors, Ubisoft saw stepped into a quagmire of racialization that continues to shape how settler and arriving colonialism <coughs> produce the legal, social, and cultural materialities of ethnic and indigenous identities. As Keith Wailu, Alondra Nelson, and Catherine Lee observe, quote, the contested nature of genetic identity takes its meaning from the nation's vexing and still unresolved ethno-racial ambivalences, unquote. Um, they continue, the marriage of colonial settler origins, a coerced and volitional migration history, ethnic uncertainty and capitalism have allowed this brand of genetic genealogy to spread widely from the commercial realm to other social arenas, unquote. As one of those social arenas in which genetic ancestry testing has taken root at the level of commercial consumption, AC3 innovates a new form of procedural plain Indian, where technology and genetics meet. If narrative has been a form of asserting possession of or desire for territory, the more secret elements of Assassin's Creed's story serve to spatialize genetics within the larger econ economies of colonial subjectivity that resurrect the, ter the terrorist assemblages of U.S. war machines in their original New World indigenous contexts. As a concept within gaming studies, proceduralism speaks to the routinization of code as an algorithmic, object-oriented language that structures games as computer programs. Building off Janet Murray's observation that digital environments for storytelling depend upon the computer's procedural power, its, quote, defining ability to execute a series of rules, unquote. Ian Bogos defines proceduralism as, quote, the practice of encapsulating specific real-world behaviors into programmatic representations, unquote. 
Procedurally, players can climb trees, kill bears with a hatchet, and assassinate British soldiers with a bow and arrow, but what they cannot do is change the inevitable march of history no matter how many British or American colonizers they kill in game. Each of those actions, and indeed the spatial, temporal, and controller commands to which the player navigates the game world, derive from a network of discrete elements operationalized after Bogos as units within a code. Connor's own efforts towards revolution and freedom are unrelentingly met by the procedurality of an intractable racism and thirst for land that defines the settler colonialism that, quote, destroys to replace. And there's yet another uh, Patrick Wolf uh, reference. <clears throat> However, rather than providing Desmond with a new and improved American Indian identity, as is typical for those seeking indigenous origins through cheek swaps, blood tests, and scientific evidence, the game refuses to assign any futurity to Connor's role as a Mohawk ancestor to Desmond. And though it might be tempting to see this turn as a refreshing take on Mohawk identity, that understands it as something more than genetic ancestral heritage, as grounded in culture, community, and continuance, what the game accomplishes is something a bit otherwise. Despite the animus' ability to reanimate DNA genetic memories into playable virtual reality simulations, the procedura, procedura, yeah, procedurality of Connor's genetic line to his descendants instead enacts when it finally merges with the foundational narratives of U.S. empire, what Sharon Holland has identified as blood strangers, the cognitive dissonances of race and family, policing and crossing, that have shaped the pain and pleasure of quotidian racial intimacies and violences. In theorizing the enmeshment of race into racism, Holland reorients queer color critique to consider how the erotic arises in the context of deeply racist practices by asking the question, quote, what happens when someone who exists in time meets someone who only occupies space, unquote. In the context of Assassin's Creed, the procedural temporar temporar temporality sorry, of Desmond and the player as machinic and actors in the 21st century, Connor, unlike Altair and Ezio before him, merely occupies space in the game. As an artifact, he remains particularly inanimate, stoic, and past tense a lamentable figure who nonetheless bears witness to the Indian removals and continued enslavement of Africans at the end of the American Revolution. The space at the end of the game is no space at all. Relegated to alternative history and forever staged within the frontiers of U.S. empire, Connor is procedurally locked in time and in a space conscripted to the production of white colonial mastery. That the Assassin's Creed universe is ambivalent at best about Connor as a series protagonist is reinforced by how quickly the creators have been to move beyond him as a subject of the series, as the recent eight Assassin's Creed four Black Flag attests. Now, not only was Haytham deemed a more compelling character for many characters, or for many players, um, a second game, Assassin's Creed Three Liberation, was released the same day by Ubisoft Sophia as an exclusive title for the PlayStation Vita handheld gaming device. Structured as a subplot along, alongside Connor's main story, AC3 Liberation features a, the first female assassin as the play, main playable protagonist and is, and is set in New Orleans. Um, Ubisoft kind of famously has declared that they are no longer going to create female assassins because the character models are just too difficult. So the, the, um, Assassin's Creed Liberation is like the one and only playable female assassin that we're going to get for a while. <clears throat> so so she, she's um, located in, um, in, 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 a, in a world in New Orleans, the bayous of Louisiana, and at Chiefs and Itza soon after the French and Indian War ended in 1763. The game centers on the exploits of an African French Creole assassin named Aveline de Grand Prix. Have any of you played this one? Okay, see you. It's, yeah, I'll talk about that after. <laughs> so everybody's played, at least familiar with Assassin's Creed with, with Connor, but not necessarily Aveline. Um, whereas Connor's story focuses on the ironies of the pursuit for liberty and freedom in the context of the American Revolution enabled through colonization, genocide, and slavery, Abilene's story purports to chart the quotidian cruelties of slavery in New France as the Spanish, British, and Americans vie for territorial control of the region. <coughs> because it restages and projects contemporary notions of race into an imagined southern landscape operationalized at a black-white binary rather than an indigenous settler one, the portable liberation game ultimately provides a more satisfying gaming experience. Delving into the, into the neoliberal fictions of racial progress and the co-optation of civil rights that invest in stories that show how much things have improved since the antebellum South, liberation offers a simplified racial landscape at the same time that it, it is able to displace slavery onto French and Spanish colonial rule. The game then traverses a haunted New Orleans landscape that replaces southeastern Indians, the Chickasaws and the Choctaw particularly, with long extinct Maya and New World indigenous peoples more broadly with creolized African slaves. 
Centering the gameplay around the mechanized, mechan mechanics of wardrobe changes, flirting, and stealth, the game spatializes race, class, gender, and heteronormativity within familiar colonial trains that not only use structure to replace, but depend upon code to procedurally conscript racism and colonialism into the machine gaze of the game interface as it pathologizes the black-white binary into the erotic imperial metonymies of recognizable but still abject new world oppressions. While Liberation retains most of the game action conventions of other Assassin's Creed titles, and in fact it often achieves these mechanics better than AC3, what is absent, however, is the multiple main character storylines and the 21st century plotline convention of the series is only present, present as a metaframing device and as a glitch. As the game loads, players are given an Ubisoft title screen along with the, dis the multicultural disclaimer, um, and then it's followed by, an by the Animus logo, which is then also quickly followed by a screen that says, Powered by Absturbia. So I'm going to try to explain what all that means. In an interview with Financial Post script writer for the game, Jim, Jill Murray explains, quote, liberation is unique. The other games so far have had the character of Desmond as a present-day anchor into the story. Liberation takes in place entirely in the past, and we do not know whose ancestor Abilene is. So we're not sure where these genetic memories have been sequenced from, but we know that this company, Abstergo Entertainment, has captured them and packaged them in order to show us. So why does this evil corporation want us to see this story? What are they getting at? That's part of the mystery of the game, unquote. In its absence, it is, sorry, it is an absence that evokes the genetic oppression of Henrietta Glass as her cellular body continues to circulate beyond her family's and descendants' consent, serving to render Abilene's ancestor into another mode of blood stranger to his or her own familial connections. Although the game does not necessarily answer any questions about genetic, familial, or racial origins fully, provocatively hints towards a concealed truth that Abstergo is trying to hide from you, the player, who is voyeuristically processing the packaged package memories from, of someone's ancestor for entertainment and perhaps other nefarious purposes. But in order to interpret the clues throughout, the player must already be familiar with the other games in the series, right? To give a quick and dirty summation, utilizing tech from the first civilization, the ones who came before, Templar engineers at Abstergo Industries have sought to tap the rich archive of human ancestral knowledge in order to acquire more ancient tech called Pieces of Eden in the game, um, to dominate humanity and control the planet for the common good of all. The assassins, anticipating Anonymous in the Occupy movement, are the only ones who can stop the corporate Templar plot to ensure that humanity retains free will. Toward that end, they hack, which disrupt, assassinate, and generally do whatever they can to prevent the Templars from achieving their goals by leaving breadcrumbs and signs for the attentive player to follow as side quests to the main story. Ostensibly re revealing the truth, again, through snippets of code, players learn over the course of the series that Adam and Eve were human slaves who stole a piece of Eden from the first civilization and set the stage for a war between humanity and the gods, who are some, uh, some form of alien life or a prior human civilization. After playing through AC3 Liberation and finding all the glitches left behind by an assassin hacker identified only as Citizen E, players learn that Abilene never joined the Templars, as the false corporatized Abstergo Indian indicates, and instead, ki instead kills her evil Templar stepmother, and learns from the ancient technology she recovers from the Maya ruins at Chichen Itza that she is the direct genealogical descendant of a very white Eve. AC3 Liberation is, in the end, obsessed with bad mothers. That, sorry, that was probably dizzying, but hopefully probable. While Liberation retains most of the game and action conventions of other Assassin's Creed titles, the other element that makes this game unique revolves around the persona mechanic in which Abilene, to successfully complete her missions, must um, use disguises to navigate the streets of New Orleans and the bayous of Louisiana. At the level of narrative and play, this, the disguises each introduce limitations and benefits, and the game encourages the predominantly white male players to experiment with drag while safely ensconcing the pleasure of their voyeuristic tourism and the erotics of racism that render Abilene as a sexualized object. As her true superhero self, Adeline can traverse the world in her full assassin's garb. In this form, she is almost always noticed by soldiers and constantly under direct attack as she races through the streets of New Orleans. But she has full access to her kit of weapons and can use firearms to shoot powder cakes and French and Spanish soldiers alike. As a quote-unquote lady, Adeline is the person her family and father know best, the daughter of a very successful French merchant, merchant and his freed slave, Jean. After Jean disappears one day when Adeline is about 10 years old, Abilene is obsessed throughout the rest of the game with finding out what happened. Raised by her father and his new wife, Madeline Delisle, she spends her days playing piano and helping her stepmother rescue slaves when and how they can. 
If any of the in-game characters reflect on her race, it's just a comment on her quote-unquote complexion. In her lady guise, the charming and seductive Aveline can stealth kill eyewitnesses to her crimes, tear down wanted posters, shoot enemies with an umbrella gun, dance with colonial officials, and flirtingly lure any French soldiers with a heart over their heads to give her jewels or escort and defend her from mercenaries. Um, <clears throat> her maneuverability is limited, however, and she can only fast walk through the streets and is prevented from jumping, climbing, and fighting in direct combat. At times, some missions require Adeline to disguise herself as a slave in order to um, get into plantations and to hide from soldiers' view by blending into crowds of slaves engaged in manual labor. Adeline carries boxes, sweeps floors, and saws wood in order to mask herself and her actions from those she is assigned to kill. In what is perhaps a stunning moment of ludonarrative dissonance, um, the slave guard Adeline can run, climb, and jump wherever she pleases, and the citizens and soldiers of New Orleans do nothing to constrain her movements. There, there are no consequences to her actions, no precarity to her freedom. She is in this guise gamically freer to maneuver than she is when she's wearing her lady persona, and when she's limited to a slow, seductive saunter through the streets of colonial New Orleans. The Assassin's Creed series has always constructed its relationship to history through discourses of accuracy, recovery, and truth, as the designers strive to bring architectural and cultural realism to the constructive units of the computer program. Drawing upon location mapping, historical reenactors, literature, and the talents of voice actors, the games strike as balance between camp and taking themselves too seriously. And Black Flag um, is about pirates, uh, of all things. <clears throat> However, as Alexander Galloway observes with games such as Civilization that deal with the past, either ideologically or through the effects of history at the level of computer code, the more one tries to pin pinpoint how the past informs the game, quote, the more one realizes that it is about the absence of history altogether or rather the transcoding of history into specific mathematical models. It is a new fetish altogether." Unquote. Within the Assassin's Creed series that links genetic memory with the truth of history, the game narrative always finds itself in tension with what the code itself desires, what it teases, and what, is able, what it is able to tell as the truth. In recovering the past from the victor on behalf of the vanquished, both storylines from the Assassin's Creed III games grapple with the more perfect union teleological trajectory of the U.S. nation-state's path toward inclusion and equality. In, in the service of liberty, Connor must remain a genetic and temporal isolate, a blood stranger who merely exists in space but not time. In the space of AC3, liberation, the truth of history that the story desires is that Abilene is a vigilant force standing against the injustices of slavery, that she may be in a relationship with her white business partner, and that her murder of others is always righteous. What the story reveals is a little more ambiguous. Abilene's attempt to free abuse slaves in and around New Orleans had only ensured that they were sent to Mexico in service to her stepmother's business interest to excavate Maya ruins and that contemporary society continues to police miscegenation at the same time that it is tantalized by it. Though the games purport to reveal an unvarnished truth of history, history as it really happened, both games assign responsibility to and for that history to these two characters alone, as the series reproduces settler colonialism at the side of a possessive genetic difference. <coughs> Sharon Holland observes that, quote, we are not done with slavery because we have yet to thoroughly investigate its psychic life. This is not to pit the past against the present in a dysfunctional causal relationship. To rethink slavery among us is to take seriously the ways in which its logic of property, belonging, and family reshaped each and every one of those concepts irrevocably, as well as the lives of the subjects, black, white, native, Hispanic, who lived within this discursive logic, unquote. And seeking to understand just what a rethinking might entail, Holland challenges queer theory to re-engage the production of desire within the context of, its, of that enduring psychic life. Quote, by anchoring the erotic to racist practice, I champion an alternative location for grounding racism in the quotidian and intimate actions that bring belonging to one another into bold relief and perhaps also into question." Unquote. How might one rethink, as a necessary and simultaneous project, the erotic life of colonialism that haunts the reiterative affective investments of subjectivity, freedom, experimentation, and equality that have come to define our contemporary global good within the circulation of U.S. imperial democracy? How are notions of belonging, genetically, property, or settling, tied to processes of becoming and unbecoming that trouble claims to identity and recognition? The tragedy and failure of both AC3 and AC3 liberation is that both games attempt to address the violences of New World slavery and colonization at an effective level of gamic action, and yet the narrative investments continually avoid addressing the normative materiality of racialization and colonization by framing both through the state-sanctioned multiculturalism of neoliberal capitalism. The title of the game series reflects the doctrine by which assassins induct new recruits into their order. 
nothing is true, everything is permitted. It originally comes from Vladimir Bartol's 1937 Orientalist novel, Alamut, but it circulates in Assassin's Creed with little reflection or explanation beyond the notion that free will derives from the realization that there is nothing true within Templar hegemony. Unfixed from any causal re referent, the creed gives assassins, and by extension players, the freedom to become and unbecome beyond the limits of the materiality of their own bodies. Within the context of the new world, the idea that nothing is true, everything is permitted, has enabled the intimate violences of slavery, colonization, and genocide. If video games are to disrupt the embodied and interlocking networks of colonialism, heteronormativity, and racism that inform them as cultural productions, then they need to reimagine space and subjectivity beyond the investments of neoliberal narratives that maintain settler whiteness, masculinity, and heterosexuality as the normal procedural elements of play. Thanks. That was a lot, sorry. <laughs> we have about 15 minutes for questions. Do you feel that games in recent years have as a whole progressed in this area? Because there's some examples like one game where I feel there are very good portrayals of indigenous cultures. Do you feel like progress as a whole has been made, even despite recent failures of some high I, I think it's kind of a, a mixed bag. Um, I mean, even Red Dead Redemption has its sort of ambivalences around how to deal with indigenous peoples. I mean, the, the one American Indian character's name is Nostis, right? Um, he has his own British anthropologist who accompanies him at all times. I mean, it, it, it um, traffics in a certain kind of expectation of indigenous, tries to disrupt it, but maybe doesn't completely manage to do that. I think, you know, we see things with Bioshock Infinite being yet another attempt to try to critique U.S. imperialism. But um, as I was talking to um, Joanna's class earlier this morning, it depends upon the idea that the main character you're playing at has is the hero of the battle of Wounded Knee. As if Wounded Knee was a battle, it's not a massacre. It gives nothing to contextualize that history in any form. So um, I think there's some exciting things that are happening. There are indigenous game designers coming to the fore. There's a game like Never Alone. There's a way in which a lot of the, um, the narrative possibilities of video games can actually serve indigenous storytelling practices that are nonlinear, that have different um, abilities to connect beyond just sort of um, plot points and event-centered experiences. But I think we're, we're still sort of at the beginning of where this could go and, and are still needing to see more. Do you think part of the reason why games are often problematic, even like Bioshock and Minda, is trying to subvert um, through making the protagonist the antagonist and through all of these sort of plays with identity and then your player identity as a character. Do you think the problem is rooted, and we saw this a lot with Infinite, with the way that you interact with the world. If the way that you interact with the world is shooting someone in the face, right. not shooting someone in the face, then how can you do anything but replicate the cycles of violence that you may or may not be trying to critique? Right. And it's interesting how Bioshock Infinite and the, and the first person shooter sort of depends upon a nostalgia for the frontier. Someone like Alexander Galloway is sort of hopeful about the, about the genre of first person shooter as something that can actually um, activate a mode of liberation by empowering players to, to sort of take control of and dominate history. But it's, you know, I think raises certain questions about, about what those violences are actually doing in the service of what. I mean, and the, and the questions, not at the level of play, sort of um, delve into the actual code, too, because of the, the way in which object-oriented language within the programming works. It depends upon creating certain kinds of objects, primitive objects, complex objects. Um, the objects themselves in, um, contain the, the code about how they're going to be acted upon. And so there's already kind of a, a, what Fanon calls thingification that's part of the colonialist um, history, where um, everything is rendered into thing within the computer code, and, and, and nothing is actually really transformed in the process, at least at this point. I mean, again, I think there's ways in which computer code and these, and these um, new modes of, of media might have a possibility to, to transform down the road, but we're sort of needing to get game designers to really grapple <coughs> with the, the history of U.S. imperialism and capitalism and what they actually mean as they, they think about these things. I, um, you were saying something about the name of your book. Oh, yeah. What what was the Indigenomicon? What, yeah, what right? did that mean? What does that mean? Yeah. Um, it's sort of a play on um, H.P. Lovecraft and the Necronomicon, right? Mm -hmm. So the Necronomicon is supposed to be the image of the law of the dead, um, and and so you know it's sort of kind of foundational to his um, 
uh, body of work where he actually is a, 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 a Lovecraft is a very complicated writer, but he's also a very racist writer, a very colonialist black writer, um, and he's sort of obsessed with the idea of an evil older than Indians that he constantly finds in the Indian burial mounds um, in the Pacific, underneath Hawaii, and other places. So, Indigenomicon for me is the image of the law of the Indian or the indigenous, and what that is actually doing within genre formations. So, we can see it within horror, survival horror, within. Um, um, fantasies. Uh, I'm, I'm, the range of the book will talk about Doctor Who, Ursula Gwynn, um, different ideas about um, how um, memory and, and visibility of Indians sort of um, function beyond actual remembrance. We, people can never really activate Indians as something that's part of the present, as having anything to do with where we're at right now. They're <coughs> always part of the long dead past that we sort of know. We know it's happened. We know Indians have been um, oppressed. We know they've been massacred. Then we know that Indians have died. We know they're no longer here but we don't actually know what that means to what we actually do as people living in the present. So that's kind of what the questions I'm thinking about for the book. Yeah. What's your all-time favorite video game? <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh, I have lots. I mean, I, I actually love playing Bioshock Infinite for all the critique. I mean, I actually liked AC Libera AC3 Liberation. It was, it was actually kind of interesting as it, as it constructed. Um, I, um, it's, it's kind of fun when you get tenure, because then you get to go back to the things you love and can be a little bit frivolous. And I'm always grateful to someone like Jack Halberstam, who says that there's a um, value to going into lo what's called low culture, that there's like actual spaces for this in the academy. Um, certainly, I, you don't get tenure writing about video games, usually. So the fact that I have tenure now means I get to do that. And, um, I've spent, I, I, I love the Elder Scrolls um, games as well. What are your thoughts on uh, video games fueling fears about future conflicts, such as the Modern Warfare uh, franchise, saying <coughs> war with Russia, or just Call of Duty in general? It's, it's interesting. Um, I, I haven't really necessarily thought about that, but when you start looking at um, cultural productions like from the, early, the late 90s, we, we sort of see it anticipating 9-11, um, um, we see it anticipating a certain kind of production of terrorist um, assemblages as Jasper Kaur would, would identify. The ways in which um, games sort of function, I think, is to tap into some of these, these kind of zeitgeist moments and identify it for us. I mean, there, it, one of the things that um, I guess I use as a justification for the next direction for my project is the fact that the um, afterword to my book talks about zombies, what I call zombie imperialism. There's a way in which zombies do um, really profound work for um, the way in which um, the United States thinks about terrorism, the ways in which it thinks about um, enemy combatants, and the way it thinks about American Indians. There's the sort of living dead, the, the um, the um, the capture the the um, the um, always return of the of the um, dead Indian the, 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 as the as the threat it, it becomes an enabler for all kinds of violence um, that the United States gets to form, form itself through and it, the, the the thing that happens with the zombie is that it ends up being sort of seen to be somehow a historical so it can circulate as if it's um, free of race but and yet it's not it's such an imperial construct the zombie comes out of the Caribbean slave trade. Um, and it's attached into, you know, again, a larger um, understanding of capitalism that then comes back onto the American continent. So by the time you get to Red Dead Redemption and the zombie pack that you can download for it, the zombies actually do take the space of the howling Indian savage that you can slaughter without any kind of racial meaning, supposedly. So I'm not really answering your question, but to say that I think there's like always this kind of, this othering that is happening in the predictive. The flip side of these questions, I think, are the ways in which video games are tied into the military industrial machine in the first place, right? There's very much um, <coughs> drone warfare has, um, attached into video game processes. It's, it's video, um, you know, play a video game has dropped a bomb on a person at this point in the Middle East, and so there, there's always a, a way in which um, that war mode kind of um, coincides with um, Call of Duty and other games. Yeah. Have you uh, um, I've looked at Fallout 3. I haven't necessarily gotten a chance to look at Fallout 2. So is it something that would be... Yeah, um, like, it, the main character starts as like this uh, indigenous native, um, the descendant of like the protagonist from the first game, mm -hmm. you know, like a tribal society. And then like, um, it's revealed that he's the chosen one, and like then goes and reclaims like, his uh, ancestors' vault or 
13 jumpsuit, okay. and then eventually takes down the United <coughs> States through. I don't know, just playing. I'll have to I'll have to look at that because the one thing that's always um, fascinating about a game like Prey, um, when you get to that's the Thomas Talodi um, character. Um, you, you're a Cherokee. Um, and um, the whole plot line is that there's this um, alien invasion of Earth, and you're uh, you know, playing as a Cherokee, throwing off the colonizing alien. And, it, and nowhere in the game does it actually acknowledge that the Cherokee are in a you know, relationship with an invading alien in the first place. And so it, it, it's a fascinating sort of experience. In that. So I don't know how Fallout 2 would connect to that kind of trajectory. Yeah, I just I mean, there, it's interesting the ways in which um, the talking about video games too is, is, is a little difficult because the market and the and the, and the, um, the industry is is transnational, and there's certainly um, you know Japan is involved in this, and there's a way in which you know the Final Fantasy games or Legend of Zelda draw upon certain ideas of indigeneity that are not necessarily located within the United States, but are attached to, um, you know into Japanese culture um, and dealing with with um, difference in those forms, and then they sort of come across the ocean and back again, um, and and there are certain stereotypes that maybe are um, consistent across them. The idea that there's forest people that are attached to you know, nature, that are you know spirits and sprites and these kinds of things. Um, but they're doing different work in different contexts, too. You were very quick to point out early on that uh, uh, in Indian country today, for example, it's really quick to jump on the bandwagon. Yeah. Assassin's Creed 3, that's a lot of fun. You guys should go play it. When we're looking at these games and the depiction of Native America, what, what are your thoughts on the impact on Native Americans directly as opposed to indirectly as they're misrepresented historically? Whereas, you know, the Native American kid says, hey, I can't wait to go out and be the hero. I'm going to be Nightfall, so I'm going to cut this guy's head off. Right. Right. <laughs> I think there's there's been a lot of study about like about these kinds of things around, especially sports mascots and the ways in which um, these misrepresentations do a lot of self-esteem damage for Native players. I mean, video games I think um, have the possibility of you kind of playing against the storyline. You can hack it. You can hack them, and you can maybe perhaps kind of think against. I know that there are a lot of Native scholars who like to play games. That they, they, um, I'm trying to think, um, Avatar, there was a video game version of the movie that a lot of people were like enjoying playing because it allowed you to kind of throw off the colonizer and you know play against the script a little bit. Um, but I think it takes a kind of critical distance to, in order to achieve that. And so it's kind of an ambivalent space. And there's like there's the way in which I was again telling Joanna's class this morning about um, infamous second son where you get to play as an actual another American Indian character in the 21st century. Um, is it Delson is the main, main character's name? He's from the Pacific Northwest tribe that they invented. Um, they, he, he, and, and so here you have the Pacific Northwest represented outside of Seattle. The very first thing that you get in your, your um, operational um, choices in the game, and, and the infamous series is notorious for giving you this sort of hard line, good approach, evil approach. And you get two different endings based upon your choices and different powers. Um, and the first choice you get is um, sacrifice the tribe, or you know, um, defend the people, um, and it's it's such an interesting starter to that. As if these are things that um, I think it feeds into well, what would happen for a native player, and you know, having to grapple with that kind of question, sacrifice the tribe, um, and it's done alongside a a, um, a very in, um, certain um, an individual notion of a, a, a sort of white empowered rights narrative where. Um, Delson and his brother, who's a tribal police officer, are dealing with this invasive military presence from some sort of arm of the United States. And their argument is, you can't do this. We have rights as citizens. Instead of saying, you can't do this. We're a tribal nation. right? You, we are, we're sovereign. You can't come onto our, our um, property. That, that's absent from that conversation. I don't know. It's a, it's a rich question. It kind of has <coughs> depths that go down in, in the heart of it. Yeah, that wasn't fair to me. <laughs> <laughs> We are uh, right at 6.30, um, and I, I do want to make sure that we filter out so that the next event...